killer mosquito chasing me around my apartment. This is all about Cuddy. Your itching always gets worse when you think about her. You're going to Cuddy's, you're gonna ring her doorbell, and you're gonna ask her out on a date, like regular people do. Endoscopy? Inconclusive. He's out. No pulse. Are right, we can get into the hospital in five. The lawyer says yes. Clear. Wait! I got a pulse. It's funny how TV programs make you want to support the bad guy like Walter White in Breaking Bad, Escobar in Narcos, or House in, well, House. I find Cameron's actions here incredibly frustrating, even though she's doing the right thing. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 5, Episode 7, The Itch. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 House videos, and this will be Episode 101. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. Buddy, we're trying to help! You can have a stroke! A bleed in your brain! Leave me alone! Severe agoraphobe, but we can only test him with whatever we can take to him. Fun. Agoraphobia symptom? Only of being shot. His girlfriend were mugged seven years ago. That's when it started. You can pick this up in a minute. Last night... Forget it. I was emotional because of the adoption falling through. That is why we kissed. I kinda hit that last night, so now she's all on my jock. She looks pretty good for someone on roofies. We do an EG, see the focus, see where the problem is, which tells us what the problem is. Go do it. And search the home for toxins. If you don't let us in, we're gonna have to leave. I haven't been in a room with anyone for a while. Could, um, could you just give me a second? Must have been scary being shot. You don't know me. Wait, what happened to the paramedic who has now got a patient-shaped fist mark lodged in his face? probably waiting for a shot at a McGregor fight. Also, is this Cameron's definition of leaving the team? Where there's a man with serious issue to be fixed, Cameron's senses start tingling. No wonder she likes House. Don't get me wrong, she probably is the right person for this job, but I just find it funny how her leaving the team means taking center stage when the new recruits are bell deep into their not so new roles. Even with Cameron's sensitivity though, it seems like she asked the wrong question. In reality, patients dealing with severe anxiety can be really tricky to navigate in consultations like these. I once had a female patient in her 20s who came in to see me after meeting multiple medical professionals for pelvic pain. She had presumed endometriosis and had previously seen a gynecologist who suggested trying out the combined contraceptive pill. She flat out refused the idea of taking that pill as the diagnosis was unproven and wanted to be referred back to the specialists for exploratory surgery. I mentioned I was happy to refer her back, but the wait would take some time and while waiting, then it would be a good idea to try the pill to see if it helped ease her symptoms. At that point, she burst into tears, mentioning that I wasn't listening to her and that she was a journalist who can't believe that medicine had now turned into a guessing game. She'd already had multiple scans and it just so happens that endometriosis is really tough to diagnose. Even though I tried to explain that, she got up and left, saying that I was the same as all the others. It was quite an upsetting experience, to be honest, because I do try and advocate for my patients as best as possible, but quite frequently our options are limited by what our socialized healthcare system can provide. There are private options still, but only a minority of patients have health insurance in the UK. Regardless of who's in the room with this patient, though, we need to figure out why he's had a crushing headache and three seizures in the last two days. The paramedics have already suggested a bleed in the brain, which isn't a bad idea if this were the real world, but what else could it be? We know he's been shot in the past, so could there still be bullet fragments in him? We also know he was seen last year by Cameron when he had flu, but how do we know it was that? As Cameron said, she just spoke to him through the doorway last year, and apparently he's got a double lock front entrance, which means there's no way that she swapped him. What if that flu wasn't flu, it was an episode of vasculitis that could have conceivably caused airway irritation, which then died down and now is coming back with a vengeance. How they'll test for that with a portable x-ray machine and ultrasound will be pretty challenging though, but we know House's favorite test is no test at all. Throw some steroids at him and hope he doesn't have an actual infection that does its best Thanos impression and turns his body into a corrected planet. Of course, there are loads more options that we can narrow down with some more clues, so let's see what this electrical trace of the brain shows. 
I, I make a lot of money writing tech manuals. I, I get stuff delivered. I work out. I don't seem very happy. This mosquito bite kept me awake. Stop scratching. You'll draw blood. This place is totally clean. No animals, no hidden drugs or alcohol, no lead in the paint. No seizures. Where was the patient when he had his first seizure? In his entry hallway, getting his mail. Bring him outside. We're doctors, not bouncers. Bring the outside to him. Come on, don't be shy. House, get them out of here. Procedure worked. Uh, He's seizing. This isn't a seizure. Uh, the stomach's killing me. Partial small bowel obstruction. Blockage explains the pain. You also need to take a look at your bowel. That blockage will rupture your intestines. I'd rather die in here than live out there. I know a surgeon who'll operate in your home. How naive of me to think Chase's specialist interests were limited to heart, lungs, kidney, bowel, testicle, and neurosurgery. It turns out he can also travel through time. That's because operating in someone's home other than in a patient will die within minutes if we don't do something in seconds kind of situation is a thing of the distant past. Back in the days when even the suggestion that doctors could pass disease between patients was heresy and wound infections were thought to be unavoidable. This was so bad that in 1865 there was a case where a 12 year old boy named James Greenless had fractured his leg after being run over by a cart. The wounds were quite severe and so the surgeons advised chopping it off immediately. Instead of doing that, a professor of surgery named Joseph Lister applied a splint to support the leg with an antiseptic called carbolic acid and kept changing the dressing around every week. Six weeks later, the boy walked out of hospital. It is a shame though that nobody saw the opportunity to change his name to James Gangreenless. Many surgical communities immediately rejected Professor Lister's theory, as at the time they thought infection was because of evil smelling air called miasma or evil smelling people called contagion. Interestingly though, we still have to do surgery in less than ideal areas, even in the modern day. Back when I was on cardiac surgery, I saw a patient who was in his late 30s, who was a bricklayer that had a severe wound infection as he was stabbed on his doorstep. A cardiac surgeon was walking by and they went to start CPR, but it wasn't working. He was bleeding inside his chest. The surgeon then did a procedure called a clamshell thoracotomy, it makes a cut under the chest on both sides to raise up the ribs and get direct access to the heart and surrounding structures to be able to stop the bleeding and restart the heart. Yes, he got a massive wound infection, but without the procedure, there is no way he'd survive. Our patient's heart is still beating though, and now we have a new clue, sudden onset abdominal pain as a response to anxiety. He may not have an obstruction at all in the bowels, it may actually be gallstones. Getting stressed could in theory lead to a gallbladder contraction that moved the stone into the connecting duct and blocked it. If the stone went down to the bowel, it could even block that, causing a condition named gallstone ileus. It doesn't explain the seizure though, but fits quite nicely here, so it has to be my first diagnostic guess. Question for you smart people, what is the gallbladder even used for? Answers down below and I'll give you it at the end of the video. Chase would put him under the house, would take him to the hospital and slip him back into his room for the post-op. You're a good person. Let's go. You do know they page me when that much surgical equipment is signed out. You might know a thing about what happened. Until he catches a post-surgical infection in his dirty apartment and... You keep him here. Your hand. Huh. It's weird. Wake up. It's Dr. Cameron. We were concerned for your safety, so we brought you to the hospital. I need some help in here! Damn it! Somebody get in here! I made the right call. If he'd flipped out after major surgery, it would have been worse. You're all off the case. Wait, why didn't you argue with her? She just threw us off the case. Because ignoring her is a lot easier. Let's see if you can clear his blockage with lactulose. I'm not gonna let you down again. Drugs aren't working. I think we should do the surgery in his house like we planned. Taub, doing anything later? Cutting out the last piece of bowel. Because is pink, flattened bili intestinal atrophy. So the team put him asleep, take him to hospital, get thrown off the case, then decide to operate on him anyway in the bacterial comfort of their own home. Very nice of the team to do that as their patient Staphylococcus aureus will now move into its new home in our agoraphobe surgical wound. Either way, it seems like we've finally made some progress and realized that there's a problem with the patient's bowel, flattened villi. But what even are villi? They're these tiny finger-like projections in the small bowel that 
increase the surface area for absorption. The light actually aren't present in the large bowel and that's an important way that they're different. Here they are flattened though, so what can cause that? The most common one is celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition triggered by gluten intake. If he had that though, then he would likely also have bloating, diarrhea, some weight loss and malabsorption as well. The onset would be much slower as it also doesn't block the bowel and it has nothing to do with the title of the episode, the itch, so what else could it be? A parasite like Giardia would be ironic considering he doesn't travel, but that doesn't cause itch. Bacteria can cause it as well, which would be known as Whipple's disease, but that again causes a much slower onset and malabsorption. TB could do it, Crohn's disease, some medications like Omazartan and or a very interesting cause could be a small intestinal T cell lymphoma. That could in theory cause all of his symptoms, including the seizures if he even had seizures in the first place and can lead to itch. The T cell lymphoma could fit really well and has to be my second diagnostic guess. It's Whipple's disease. Explains the seizure and the stomach pain. Cautery. Wait, the gas! It always happens. Nothing to sue about. Treat him for the burns, put him on antibiotics for the Whipples. My legs are numb. I can't feel them at all. That always happens. That always happens. Setting a patient on fire is one thing, but setting a patient on fire with their lawyer present is something else. This may seem like medical fiction, but it is actually possible to ignite a patient because of the free air around their gut. Thankfully, that's not from personal experience. In real life, though, it is limited to cases where there's a hole in the bowel because it's the gas produced inside the bowel that is flammable. They do lose some accuracy points here though as the patient was just about being closed up so it's safe to cauterize then but isn't when the abdomen is first being opened. That's because when all the free air has been allowed to disperse then the flamethrower risk drops dramatically. I guess it's hard to see the outside world as a fun place with helpful people when you're looking at it through your own flames. Either way, it seems like we've got a systemic condition on our hands as our patient can't feel their own legs. It's also important to know whether he just can't feel them or also can't move them, which can be caused by very different things. He said can't feel though, so we'll go for that for now. We know his absorption isn't the best at the moment, so he could have gone and gotten himself a B12 deficiency, which is usually absorbed at the end of the small intestine. But what does B12 even do? Well, it helps support our blood and nerve cells and make DNA. And so when it's low, it can cause neurological symptoms as well as anemia. Other causes of peripheral neuropathy, which this patient has, that we do see are thyroid dysfunction, excess alcohol intake, vasculitis and diabetes. None of these really happen suddenly on both sides like that though, so what else could this be? Lymphoma, which we mentioned earlier. If the cancer is pressing on the nerves, supplying his legs, it could in theory cause his numbness. It could also be some absolutely mild other conditions like polio, Guillain-Barre or transverse myelitis. I definitely want to do tests for the common conditions which I mentioned earlier along with an antibody screen, nerve conduction studies and an MRI of a spine and take it from there. So question for you smart people, what is the single biggest risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes? Answer this down below and I'll give it to you at the end of the video. New symptom, peripheral neuropathy. Not Whipple's. This has got to be celiac. Force feed him wheat. And do an endoscopy as it hits his duodenum. I've always had some feelings for you. Let's have dinner tomorrow night. Or maybe it'd be better if we just had sex in front of House's office. I assume the point of this is to make him jealous. People who get shot often get PTSD. It's very treatable with drugs and therapy. My girlfriend was with me when I got shot. She died. I was like this before the shooting. She was the only reason that I ever wanted to go out. He's on morphine. When you restock, you will actually be giving Cameron IV bags of saline. Your marriage is falling apart. She's having me sleep on the couch. killer mosquito chasing me around my apartment. This is all about Cuddy. Your itching always gets worse when you think about her. You're going to Cuddy's, you're gonna ring her doorbell, and you're gonna ask her out on a date, like regular people do. Endoscopy? Inconclusive. He's out. No pulse. We can get him to the hospital in five. The lawyer says yes. Clear. Wait! I got a pulse. It's funny how TV programs make you want to support the bad guy like Walter White in Breaking Bad, Escobar in Narcos, or House in, well, 
house. I find Cameron's actions here incredibly frustrating, even though she's doing the right thing. Like, this is the second time she's spoiled House's plan to get the patient out of the house. We're definitely further forward here though, as we know the patient has had a cardiac arrest, possibly in response to our succulent gluten meal. I can't think of why that would happen unless it was overly loaded with potassium, but his kidneys are functioning. There would have to be an entire mashed up banana plantation in his bowl to make that happen, so that can't be it. Maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way and need to think back to the itch. What if the patient's home is ironically what's making him unwell, as he had a hidden bite somewhere that is actually causing a slow leak of festering fluid into his blood. If he's lacking sensation, then that could explain his symptoms and the flattening of his bowel villi as a response to sepsis. We know he already doesn't like people being close to him, so presumably he hasn't been examined. He didn't improve with antibacterials though, so maybe it's a virus or other opportunistic pathogen that this wouldn't work for. I'm unsure of the exact pathogen, so let's get more clues. It's hard to back to sinus rhythm, but it's bradycardic. Tau's putting in a temporary pacemaker. Could be lymphoma. No way to see it on the abdomen. It has to be a poison. How often do you wash your tub? Every couple days. Bleach and ammonia? Yeah. Ammonia and bleach mix chlorine gas. Permanent pacemakers need precision. You knew I'd have to say no, but you just wanted a reason to be angry at me. You never offered me a drawer. You never cleared out your closet for me. I can't keep chasing you forever. I figured you'd put him on saline, so I switched him back to morphine. His abdominal pain. It was on morphine. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. It seems like House just had the real epiphany moment. The patient has abdominal pain while on morphine, which means whatever condition he has doesn't respond to it or is actually caused by it. He could have narcotic bowel syndrome. That's when chronic opiate use actually has effects on the bowel that lead to the abdominal pain. We know the patient makes good money writing tech manuals, so maybe he uses that to get his kicks another way, drug use. It would also explain the episode title, The Itch, as we know that is a very common side effect of chronic opiate use, and House has been itching the whole episode. It's a clue which shows House that he has more in common with the patient than he thought. Oh, that works on so many different levels. So narcotic bowel syndrome has to be my final diagnostic guess. The treatment then is a slow withdrawal of the opiates as stopping suddenly could have put him into opiate withdrawal and caused the cardiac arrest. We are now locked in and so is the patient, thanks to Cameron. He is being poisoned. What's this density, his hip? You think he's got lead poisoning? Hold him down. Bugger used hollow points. Your doctor has missed a couple. He's lying. He doesn't even think he's happy here. And why did Taub find rose petals in your entry hallway? You were trying to go leave flowers on her grave. Or just lock yourself up and pretend you're happy. I cleaned out a drawer for you. Lead poisoning from old bullet wounds. Damn, I did mention they could still have fragments from the shooting, but no diagnostic guess and no heavy metal poisoning. Good diagnosis all in all, but I'm surprised it didn't actually incorporate the itch aspect from the title. That seemed more related to this house cuddy dance of romance, not romance that's going on. Interesting that house called out the patient for hiding from his demons, but couldn't confront his own when it came down to it. To think as doctors, we do have to lead by example as patients do trust us more when we take our own advice. That would explain why one study found that trust for a normal weight doctor was four out of five, but for an obese doctor that dropped by almost 20% to 3.3 out of 5 before even hearing a word. Overall, quite an interesting episode, but not as spicy as some of the others in season 5. So 6.5 out of 10 entertainment, 6 out of 10 accuracy, and 6 out of 10 diagnosis. The gallbladder is used to store bile from the liver, which it releases as a response to a fatty meal and helps to digest the fat as they come into the intestine from the stomach. Being overweight is the largest risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes. This episode doesn't make full sense until you watch the previous one where Cuddy tries to forage into parenthood here 